Hi everyone! In this video, we're going to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus at three different levels of rigor. We'll discover the underlying intuition for why integrals and derivatives are opposites, as well as how that intuition relates to the rigorous proof of the theorem. As an added bonus, we'll learn about the importance of both formality and informality in understanding proofs. Let's get started. This video assumes that you are familiar with the basic topics of calculus, and hopefully you've been exposed to the fundamental theorem already. However, let's review what it says for good measure. Let's first take a look at what this equation is actually saying. The integral on the left gives the area under a continuous curve f between a fixed lower bound and a variable upper bound. Because x is the only independent variable, we can rewrite this integral as a function, which we'll call a of x, with the a standing for area. Using this definition, the fundamental theorem looks much simpler, and its meaning is clearer. It states that the rate of change of the area function at a given point is equal to the value of the curve f at that point. Let's see if we can understand what this means and why it's true. We begin by simply visualizing the area function. The input to this function, x, is how far across the page my hand is, and the function's output is the amount of blue ink I've used, or the total area under the curve up until x. Our goal is to find out how quickly the area grows as its upper bound increases. Notice that as I move my hand further to the right, the space between the x-axis and the curve is increasing. The larger this space is, the more ink it takes to keep up with the growth of the area function. Specifically, the amount of area added at a given point is equal to the distance between the x-axis and the curve f, which is, in turn, equal to the curve's height, f of x. This is exactly what the fundamental theorem says, completing our proof. The downside of this argument is that it's not very rigorous. It visually shows how the height of the function determines the area's rate of growth, but never once actually mentions the derivative. Let's see if we can make this proof more rigorous by applying the definition of the derivative, finding the difference in area for a small change in x. We begin proof 2 by changing x by a small amount, delta x, and visualizing the effect this has on a. We can examine the exact change in the area function, but we can also approximate it using a rectangle. These two regions have different areas, but as delta x gets smaller, the areas become closer and closer to each other. Let's write down this estimate algebraically. Since the total area to the left of x plus delta x is equal to a of x plus delta x, and the area to the left of x is equal to a of x, the change in area is equal to the difference of these two values. Now we turn to the rectangle. Notice that it has a width of delta x and a height of f of x, so its area is equal to f of x times delta x. Once we divide both sides by delta x, the equation starts to look very familiar. Our final step is to take the limit as delta x approaches zero, which does two important things. First, it completes the definition of the derivative on the left-hand side, which allows us to rewrite it as a prime of x. Second, it turns the approximately equal sign into an equal sign, since the area of the rectangle becomes infinitely close to the actual difference in area. This proves the theorem. When I first saw this proof, it felt like the construction was pulled out of thin air to magically generate the desired formula. However, it is really just a way to clarify what the vertical line in proof 1 actually was, the limit of an increasingly thin rectangle. Examining this rectangle in proof 2 revealed that the difference in area divided by the difference in x approaches the height of the function, which is a more precise version of the claim we made in proof 1. However, Proof 2 still contains a crucial step that is not fully justified. How do we know that the area of the rectangular approximation actually approaches the true difference in area? To answer that, we turn to proof 3. We begin with the same setup as proof 2, but take a closer look at the change in area. Instead of creating a single rectangular approximation using the height of f at x, Let's create two rectangles, one using the minimum value of f between x and delta x, and one using the maximum value. We'll call the location of the minimum u, 
and the location of the maximum v. So the two rectangles have a height of f of u and f of v, respectively. We know these values have to exist because of the extreme value theorem. There are now three ways to describe the difference in area, two approximate and one exact. The minimum height rectangle has an area of f of u times delta x, and the maximum height rectangle has an area of f of v times delta x. We can describe the exact difference in area the same way we did for proof 2, as a of x plus delta x minus a of x. The reason we created these rectangles is because they give us an upper and lower bound for the actual difference in area. f of u is always less than or equal to the curve f, as long as we're between x and x plus delta x. Likewise, f of v is always greater than or equal to f. Because of this, the actual area underneath f between x and x plus delta x has to be between the areas of these two rectangles, due to the comparison property of integrals. Let's write out our inequality and take the limit as delta x approaches 0, just like we did in proof 2. We'll also repeat the step of dividing all three expressions by delta x. In order to figure out what the left and right sides of this inequality approach, we need to examine u and v as delta x approaches 0. Since we defined u to be a value between x and x plus delta x, u gets squished between these two values as delta x gets smaller, and it ultimately approaches x. This means that we can replace our limit as delta x goes to 0 with a new limit, where instead u goes to x. Taking this limit of f of u gives a result of f of x. These two steps are allowed because of the squeeze theorem and the fact that f is a continuous function. Applying the same logic for v, we have the value of two of the three limits in our inequality. Let's finally put everything together. Substituting in our values for the left and right limits, we see that the limit in the center is sandwiched between two limits that both approach f of x. Using the squeeze theorem one last time, we show that the limit must therefore be equal to f of x. It took many constructions, properties, and calculations, but we have proven the fundamental theorem of calculus beyond a shadow of a doubt. These three proofs each have their own advantages, since they all strike a different balance between intuition and rigor. However, the proofs aren't just different options to choose between. They actually support each other and work together to fully explain the ideas behind the theorem. More rigorous proofs allow for the hand-wavy, broad statements that make intuitive proofs possible. The level 3 proof justified our claim that the rectangular approximation in level 2 really does approach the true difference in area. And this rectangular approximation explained how our line in level 1 actually represented the rate of change of the area function. Without these rigorous proofs, we can't know what the simpler proofs mean precisely or why they work. Intuitive proofs also help us understand more complex ones. Knowing what the constructions and rigorous proofs represent on a simpler level aids immensely in following along. Intuitions also explain why mathematicians choose certain approaches over others. The approach of the level 3 proof, for example, would feel arbitrary if you weren't aware of the problems in the previous two proofs that the third was designed to solve. Truly understanding a theorem means knowing both the general reasons why it's true and also how to justify these broad claims. Now you have this understanding about the fundamental theorem of calculus, and I encourage you to seek the same understanding for other theorems you come across in the future. Thanks so much for watching.